All right, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I'm going to switch our focus a little bit uh, to talk about how misinformation plays out in the mass media. I'm the science and health editor at the Washington Post. Um, also, I'm on Twitter, and uh, I'll have my contact information at the end. If you ever have a story you think we need to be covering, please send tips or leak to us. Uh, there are many ways to do so securely, so you can be, you know, protect, your, protect your privacy. Um, Anyhow, there are kind of three overlapping ways that we deal with misinformation at this moment. Um, so I'm going to talk about how uh, we, in the real, legitimate, uh, fact-based, or attempting to be evidence-based media, uh, try to show that we're not fake news. Um, how we try to compete with fake news, which is hard to do because they're very good at what they do, the fake news purveyors. And also how we try to help readers understand sort of the origins and spread and influence of, of misinformation, of fake news. And I said try in each of these because um, it's an attempt. It's a constant arms race. We're not really winning. Uh, we're not completely losing, but it's, uh, it's a constant effort. And it's something that all of us need to, to be thinking about and participating in. Um, and so, of course, the, the reason we have to uh, make a special effort to show that we're trustworthy and legitimate and, and basing our reporting on facts is that every morning the President of the United States wakes up and tweets about how uh, CNN and NBC, Washington Post, how we're fake news, uh, the enemy of the American people, things like that. So this is just a count of, of which, which outlets he specifically calls out as being fake. Um, you'll notice that Fox, uh, so far, has escaped his wrath. Uh, and so what we're doing in response to that is we're trying to be a lot more transparent and um, just explain to people how journalism works. Because, you know, as, as with any of you, in any of your um, career specialties, uh, you know, people tend to not know how you do your jobs. And traditionally, the mass media has not made a big deal of explaining what we do. It was considered sort of, you know, self-indulgent or, we, you know, we didn't want to make ourselves the story. Um, you know, we had this facade of being completely objective, uh, you know, explainers of reality, which is not entirely true. Um, so now we're trying to make a bigger deal out of saying, here's how anonymous sources work. Here's how we do reporting. Here's how we documented the story. And especially when we get um, documents uh, through FOIA requests, if somebody leaks something to us, if we have a whole set of people who can only speak on background so they don't get fired or get in other kind of trouble, we try to be much more explicit about where we got our information and why we know that, that it's believable and according to our standards. Um, and then we're also trying to be more transparent and explain the difference between news and opinion, uh, because that's gotten so blurred, particularly in social media. And so every time we have a story that's written uh, that from a first person perspective, we label it perspective. And then if, you, uh, if you're reading this online, you hover over the word perspective, a little drop down box pops up to explain what perspective means. Now, of course, the problem is that anybody sophisticated enough to hover over a word and look at the drop down box and read the definition probably already knows the difference between perspective and news, but anyhow, that's one of the many things we're trying to do to sort of you know, signal that we are virtuous and have nothing to hide here and are not faking it. Uh, and then of course another thing, and so a lot of publications are making a bigger deal out of this now, and this is STAT. Does anybody read STAT? It's a, it's a really nice um, yeah, uh, online publication that covers uh, biomedical research, and they do first opinion pieces and label them as first opinion, and most places are doing this, trying to be more specific about it now. Uh, and then, of course, what we do in journalism is fact-checking. And yesterday was International Fact-Checking Day, so the day after April Fool's Day, if you got burned on the first, the idea is you'll come in the, on the second and want to know, okay, how do we know what's real? How do we know it's not real? And uh, it's sort of a celebration of fact-checking, which is what journalists have been doing for a lot, you know, for a long time, um, a lot more recently. Uh, so uh, at the Post, we have a, a fact-checker who judges things. Um, we, we do a lot of fact checking, of course, of environmental claims, uh, a lot of political claims, but a lot of health and science claims too. Uh, things are rated on a scale of one to four Pinocchios, um, as you know, with the nose growing as he, as he lies. So uh, this one got four Pinocchios. Uh, and we had to change our scale um, because you can say something, you can, you can repeat misinformation, you can repeat a falsehood. Uh, and get four Pinocchios, but there's something special about repeating the falsehood again and again and again and again after it's been repeatedly shown to be false. And so the bottomless Pinocchio is our new category of things that are repeated 20 times or more. Uh, and we've already, the president already has quite a few bottomless Pinocchios accumulated for things he keeps saying that are just wrong and wrong and wrong. And he keeps saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, because repetition works. Um, so not everything uh, we fact check is political. And a lot of what we do on the health and science desk is look at misinformation in the health realm. 
um, because this is where, you know, as, as some of the other speakers have said, this is where a lot of people encounter misinformation that has an impact on their daily lives. So for instance, um, and, and one of the problems uh, is that with our sort of libertarian free market approach to uh, healthcare and, uh, and you know, supposed healthcare, that people can make all kinds of claims. Um, there, are, there are about a thousand stem cell clinics in the US now that say they can like suck some fat out of your body, spin it in a centrifuge, and inject it somewhere else to fix your arthritis, your macular degeneration. They say they can cure autism, multiple sclerosis. It's horrible. It's dangerous. It's expensive. It's harming people. Um, but the federal government doesn't regulate these things. And so that's where journalism comes in and says, no, this is, this is dangerous. This is wrong. Here are the facts. So that's a sort of uh, you know, journalistic fact checking that we do. Um, and then uh, yeah, we, we, as, uh, oh shoot, which of you said that any nutrition story is false? Was that you, David? Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, we, we have a lot of stories saying, no, this is just wrong. And it's particularly bad for things that are either marketed to or by athletes. Uh, so this is a story from Christy Ashwanen, who's speaking tomorrow about some of the dangers of, of nutritional supplements. And they, you know, they're marketed as these you know, miracle things will make you faster and stronger, um, but they will just make you fail your drug test and get you out a lot of money. Uh, and then we try to use uh, the principles of um, the science of science communication to inform what we do increasingly. Uh, and so this is an example of, uh, of a story that's kind of debunking the myth of this, um, of a particular heart rate zone that helps you burn fat. And so what we tried to do is not just say, no, 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 that's wrong, it doesn't work that way, but in the story say, here's how it really works, and provide some alternative explanations to, to sort of replace the myth with actual evidence. Um, and this story did very well, and a lot of these do, uh, especially when there's a, a, a widespread belief um, that people recognize as having heard or just sort of vaguely thought it was true. And if we can provide um, you know, a, way, a, a better way of understanding it and a replacement idea, uh, these stories tend to do well and people share them widely. I think it makes them feel you know, smarter about you know, what's, what's actually happening in the world, and they want their friends to know too, this is what's real, this is what's not. Um, so we do, uh, we, we, we try to, to, to use that principle that we've, that we've talked about and we'll keep talking about. Um, and then who here, has anybody here taken a, a training with Compass that Nancy Barron runs? She's here too in the audience. Yeah, they're fantastic trainings. And there's all kinds of practical advice for how scientists can kind of tell their own stories, explain their own research, why it matters. And um, some of the advice she has is, are things that we try to use in journalism too. Um, you know, if you want to get your story across, you should find a good metaphor, find a very specific example uh, to explain what your work does, uh, pick a memorable and simple statistic to, to make the story sticky and to make people understand it and wanna share it. And um, which is great advice and things that we're all trying to do in journalism, but unfortunately it's also what uh, fake news does, what misinformation does. They use some of the same tricks and they're unconstrained by reality so they can say anything. Uh, so we do, you know, debunking. This is uh, when I was at Slate a few years ago. We ran a, a big story on natural news, which is another one of, at the time, it was one of the, the most read sites on Facebook and spreading just all sorts of outlandish things. It's only gotten worse. It, it um, traffics in a lot of conspiracy theories. And uh, its stories are very dramatic. They usually have a protagonist who's sympathetic and, you know, uh, simple statistics. And, you know, you need to know this because there's danger and they push all your buttons. Um, and, you know, they don't just say salt will save your life, but Himalayan bath salts will save your life. So they use all the tricks. So this is what we're competing against. Um, and, and one of the things we do is try to say why this is wrong and you shouldn't be sharing it on Facebook. And if you see somebody sharing it on Facebook, please tell them you know, where to get better information. Um, let's see. She'll use. Oops, skipped a couple. Um, and another thing we're trying to do, you know, with, with anti-vaccines, that's right now especially, this is really the, one of, one of the, the bigger concerns is the, the you know, increase, the, the rise and the spread on social media of, of anti-vaccine movement. And so one of the lessons we tried to use here in this story is, uh, the, uh, this was a case where a, a, a pediat pediatric practice posted a video reminding parents to come get their kids vaccinated against HPV, just simple, um, practical, here's why you can do it, prevent your kids from getting cancer, hooray. And they posted this video and there was a small uptick in parents coming in to, to get their kids vaccinated. Um, but then the anti-vaxxers found it and, and had a, an, a, 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 an organized attack on this poor pediatric clinic. 
And so um, what the doctors did is, you know, they recognized right away what was happening. And so they started gathering all the comments and tracing them through Facebook to figure out where they came from. And they teamed up with some scientists to sort of, you know, do a, a, a meta analysis, or well, do a, a meta sort of study of where did this attack come from? Who are these trolls? What platforms are they, are they trying to get, this, get us at? And uh, so they did a study, they published in the paper, and then we used this to make sort of a story with a narrative with um, a lot of tension and with the doctors being actual people, not just sort of vague doctors, but um, they were under attack and this is what they did to fight back to make sort of a, a more memorable story to not just fight anti-vaccine movement with simple facts, but, but with, a, with a narrative that can compete and be interesting. Uh, so, and then, uh, you know, some of the other research has, has shown that if you can uh, meet people where they are, if you can show that you have shared values, uh, shared backgrounds, that you're a, a trusted human being, your, your message can, can have a lot more power. And so this was a, an op-ed in the, in the Washington Post by Maria Zuber, who's vice president of research at MIT and at the time was chair of the National Science Board. But she's also um, the child of coal miners on both generations. She grew up in a coal mining town. Her grandfather died of black lung disease right before she was born. And so she had a really, really moving essay about how, uh, you know, Trump is saying we need to protect the coal industry and preserve coal mining towns. And she said, no, 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 this, you know, you're not helping the coal miners. This is a really miserable life. And it was a very, um, very touching story that, that reached a lot of people and also got a, got a lot of um, got a lot of attention. So that was sort of using using the principle that you know you want to have your messenger find a way to communicate and, and demonstrate that they're a real person. As we've talked about, you know, with social media is the competition. Um, we're, you know, and there was this fringe, a very small fringe belief that the uh, earth is flat. It's never really gone away, uh, even though it's been disproven for, you know, hundreds or thousands of years, depending on how you count. Um, but this, this, because of YouTube largely, this started getting more attention. Um, so here's a nice tweet about it. In the 90s, we were saying, we cloned a sheep, we landed on Mars, and now we have to say for the last time, the Earth is round. <laughs> so it feels like sometimes we're going backwards. Um, and by the way, if, if any of you, is anybody on Twitter? A lot of you on Twitter, I hope, yeah. If you're not, if you're a Twitter skeptic, this is the sort of reason to be on Twitter. Um, because it's funny, because you share the outrage, you feel a sense of community, and it just, ah! So anyhow, that, these are the joys of Twitter. Um, and then journalism, science, documenting this problem, uh, we can put pressure on YouTube, on, on, on Google, on Facebook, on Twitter to do something about it, to recognize that they're part of the problem and um, in, in this case suppress the, the algorithms that were making these conspiracy videos so easy to, to find. So those are some consequences of, of exposing these problems. Um, oops. And then another thing we're doing is uh, trying to, to cover the science of it, you know, to cover the research that we're presenting, that is being presented in, in these two days. Uh, so we're, we've covered the Dunning-Kruger effect to help people understand why um, somebody can be completely ignorant and completely self-confident and completely wrong, because uh, it's, it's a phenomenon we all experience. Uh, and then we also cover the, uh, the work on how fake news is spreading. And this is a study David just had earlier, I think this, earlier this year, about uh, where, where is the Twitter false information coming from. So by sharing the social science, we're hoping to sort of inoculate readers and help them understand you know, why, why misinformation is spreading so quickly, what they, you know, how they can recognize it, what they can do about it in some cases. And so just in conclusion, it's up to all of us. Uh, it's a, it is a battle between misinformation and real information, especially on social media. So if you can, share real news and call out fake news, especially if it's somebody you know personally, uh, and get in touch with tips anytime.